go back in time, shall we? October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launched a satellite. The word satellite wasn't even common at the time. They launched an artificial moon around Earth. It was called Sputnik 1. It was a radio transmitter that sent out just bleep signals. Bleep, bleep. Hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth circling satellite. What was it launched in? A hollowed out intercontinental ballistic missile shell. That's what it was launched with. So here in the United States, we completely freaked out for multiple reasons. First, they beat us at something technological that like they're not supposed to because they're like communists and we are free market enterprise, high tech America. How could they possibly beat us at something that required clear advances in science, technology, engineering, and math. That spooked us. A. B. The military is spooked because if they can send a hollowed out intercontinental ballistic missile over our heads, they can send one that contains a warhead. By the way, your airspace is sort of a sovereign place. Other countries can't fly over your country in your airspace without your explicit permission to do so. But a satellite orbits above the atmosphere. So it is not technically your airspace. It's your space space. But there were no treaties about space space before. Within a year, middle of 1958, President Eisenhower would sign into law the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Act where we reallocated resources, a other smaller agencies, and together, by the first week of October, the doors of NASA were open for business. By the way, NASA is a civilian agency, yet practically every astronaut who was selected and flew was drawn from the military, either the active military or on detail from the military or retired military. All right, we're off to the races, literally off to the races. So Russia puts up the first satellite. They put up the first non-human animal, Laika, a dog, a homeless dog from the streets of Moscow. Never had plans to bring the dog back alive, by the way, burned up on re-entry. They put up the first human, that was Yuri Gagarin. All of this, before we could put up a human, they did all of that, okay? And we're struggling mightily to do something because we were getting bested. So, John F. Kennedy, May 1961, six weeks after Yuri Gagarin successfully comes out of orbit, gives a speech to the joint session of Congress and says, if the events of recent weeks are any indication of the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, then we know, need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a battle cry against communism. How else are you gonna get Congress to write checks? There's a lot of stirring language around that speech and others he gave at that time that made you think this is an American thing to do. But at the end of the day, it got done because we perceived a threat. Our sworn enemy in the Cold War was beating us at a highly visible science and technology activity. So Kennedy says, let's go to the moon. Well, that would leapfrog all of the Russian advances. So we target the moon, thus was born the Apollo project. We go from Mercury, which hosts one astronaut per launch to Gemini hosting, guess how many? Of course, two Gemini followed by Apollo, three astronauts to the moon and back. We tell ourselves we won that race because we declared the finish line to be the moon but practically every other important benchmark for access to space, Russia did first. They put up the first woman in orbit, the first dark-skinned person, a Cuban. Remember, Cuba was on their side at the time. Did all this before we did, and we don't tell ourselves that enough because we, we, I think justifiably, we celebrate the fact that we got to the moon and that's an interesting target for anybody, for our species. and. In all fairness to we as Americans, the plaque that's on the moon says, we come in peace for all mankind. That's what it says. And there's a picture of the earth, the two halves of the earth. 
We didn't say we have conquered the moon and we will try. Yes, there's an American flag there because that's what people do when you're in a mountaintop and things. But the plaque that contains the messaging, that felt honest to me. So when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, the three astronauts on Apollo 11, returned to Earth, they were received worldwide. And if you speak to Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, at the time, the, what they would tell you is, people would come up to them and not say, you did it. They would say, we did it. We, humans, did it. And I was particularly moved upon learning that because any triumph of science and technology is really for us all, because we're humans and these are triumphs of the human mind and our ingenuity. So we land on the moon in 1969. We stopped going to the moon in 1972. Russia wasn't there. No longer was there a geopolitical motivation to pursue that activity. People not knowing why we were going to the moon watched us go to the moon and say, oh, at this rate, by, it, by 1980, we'll be on Mars. In the year 2000, we'll have thousands of people living and working in space. We only went to beat the Soviets. That's it. So, 1972, the program gets canceled. People want to blame Nixon. No, you don't blame, yes, he was president, but you don't blame Nixon for that. You recognize the geopolitical forces that make any of this happen to begin with. We could have stayed on the moon in 1972. We didn't. Could have gone back in 1980. We didn't. 1990, 2000, 2010. No. Is anyone else going to the moon? No. So we don't feel the force operating on our ambitions. Again, we are reactive as a nation way more and way more effectively than we are proactive. 2004, I'm appointed by George W. Bush to serve on a White House commission to study the future of NASA. What sort of missions should it have? By the way, there were no geopolitical forcing on us at the time. It's just NASA, there's NASA, we got NASA, we went to the moon back then, what should we do in the future? I'm on this commission. It was nicknamed the Moon and Mars Commission. What we did was lay out a path for us to continue our presence and advance in space and how to go on to Mars beyond that. We created this plan to use monies that NASA had been using for the space shuttle and phase that out and phase in a plan to return to the moon and go on to Mars. So there's no new money here. It would just be a readjustment of it. Well, some budget people got a hold of it and noticed that it might take a trillion dollars to get to Mars. And it was DOA. In peacetime, spend a trillion dollars? No. NASA's budget was already $30 billion a year. 30 billion. So how long does it take to get to a trillion? at $30 billion a year. It takes 30 years. We could get to Mars in 30 years with astronauts, of course, I'm referring to. But that's not the number that landed heavily on people's conscience. It was the trillion dollars. All right, so fine, but we did the really good homework for that report. And there it languishes. We go into the 20 teens. 2016, Trump gets elected president, okay? You know what's happening around then? China says, they want to put Taikonauts on the moon. Everything China has said they want to do in space, they have done in space. Let's rewind for a moment. Back when we stopped going to the moon, we wanted to do something interesting in space. They said, let's have a space station. Originally, it was Space Station Freedom. Then the Soviet Union collapses. There are Russian scientists. We don't want them going to whoever might be the new enemy. We want to make friends with them. So we turn the Space Station Freedom into the International Space Station, and the principal international partners is the United States and Russia. Then Europe joins in and other countries as well. But that means they are our friends post-Cold War era. We said, China, not you. You're not invited because you have human rights violations that we will hold against you and prevent you from participating with the rest of us. I'm a scientist, not a politician, so I don't know how serious, severe, or widespread human rights violations are around the world at any given time, but I do know the consequence of disinviting China. 
we're now talking about the 1990s into the 2000s, they have a rapidly growing economy. And anytime you have a growing economy, there is money to spend on things, on whatever you want, for whatever are your purposes. So China births their space program. They said they're gonna put an astronaut in orbit. A Taikonaut is their word for astronaut. Taikonaut's in orbit. They're gonna create a space station. There it is. Whatever they said they're gonna do, they're gonna do. So when they said, we wanna put astronauts on the moon, we sat up straight. And under Trump, Trump says, let's task NASA to go back to the moon. And it sounded like, well, where did this come from? We haven't been there in 30 years, why are you saying it now? So there were Trump haters that said, he's just boosting his own ego here. But there's a geopolitical force operating. NASA creates a new program called Artemis. This would be to return to the moon with a crew, okay? And and ultimately pitch tent there, set up a, a, a base camp, a, not a colony so much as a, a research station on the moon. Once again, we are reacting to a perceived threat, be it real or imagined. There's a handoff from President Trump to President Biden, and Biden doesn't say, Trump, this moon thing, you, what are you, that was just a vanity project. We're gonna cancel it. No, it's sustained. That's what happens when you're reacting geopolitically rather than local politically. Geopolitics rides above it all. Yes, the Artemis program is still in play. There are a bunch of delays. By the way, so is China. Oh, anyhow, when China went to the moon, they made a flag that was stitched out of basalt. Basalt is rock, volcanic rock. It will never fade. It will never decompose. Ultraviolet light has nothing to say to it. And so it's little things like that, that kind of, in America, we say, we gotta do something. We gotta do something better, something, something more inventive. By the way, none of that's gonna happen if we keep cutting science budgets and NASA's budget. If we keep cutting science the way we are, then, other countries that are not cutting science will rise up past us and we will stand at the fence wondering how they did it. But maybe one day we all go into space together. Actually, that's the goal of the Artemis Accord. It's a document of behavior and ethics for the future of space exploration. For example, if you go into space and you're a nation, a sovereign nation, you conduct an experiment and you learn that something could put future astronauts at risk, this commits you to share those results with other countries so that their astronauts are not put at risk. And when you share information, then in a way, even if you're going into space separately, if the information is shared, because that's how science works, then everyone is effectively going into space together. Meanwhile, Russia and China, who have not signed the Artemis Accords, actually have an agreement with each other for their future of establishing base stations on the moon, not only research on its surface, but in orbit. And they've invited other countries to participate in that pact. So we'll see how this plays out in the future. I'd like to think space is for everybody because it's vast. It is a little weird when you think about it. There's a little speck called Earth and we've divided up the land masses as we have. And then we go into space and we want to like divide up space. <laughs> As an astrophysicist, that's freaking absurd. Okay, just between you and me, just so you know. This is another what's up with that? The space race on Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson bidding you to keep looking up.